Take your Bibles and turn to, where are we? Revelation. Oh, that's right. Revelation. And we're in verse, uh, chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And I hope that you have uh, been enjoying Revelation. It has been one of the most sweet times for me personally that I've ever had in preaching through the Word of God. I, I just thank God for this book and uh, what it, it means to us during this time of pandemic. Uh, all of us, uh, I think we're all kind of in this together in that we've never been through this before, and yet God is faithfully bringing us through. Revelation 17 uh, is talking about some really heavy stuff. You're talking about the destruction of all false religion in the world. False religion, by definition, is any religion other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. If any religion is not centered exclusively, not just does it include a little bit of Jesus, but if it's not focused exclusively on Jesus Christ, it is false religion. There is only one way to God, and that is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 17, we see literally the eradication of all false religion in the world. False religion is compared in the book of Revelation to an idolatrous harlot that seduces sinful mankind. And the book of Revelation has, it goes back into the Old Testament and picks out a word for false religion, and it's not hard to pick it out. That word is Babylon. And the reason they chose Babylon under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is because Babylon really is where all false religion began. If you go back to the Tower of Babel, which is where Babylon came from, that's where false religion came. When these people came and they wanted to build a ziggurat, a tower to heaven, and they wanted to worship God on their own terms. How many of you know somebody that doesn't want to worship the God of the Bible? They want to worship God on their own terms. Does anybody know anybody like that? I got my hands on. I know a lot of them. They don't want to worship the Bible way. They don't want to worship Jesus Christ. They just want to come up with their own religion. Well, that's what happened at Babylon. And God came down, destroyed that, uh, that tower, and they spread out everywhere all over the world. And when they did, they took their false religion with them. And so idolatry is everywhere. God then goes to Abraham and through him and through Isaac, his son, and through Jacob, his son, and through the 12 sons of Jacob, Israel. You have a new monotheistic religion called Judaism. And from that would come the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who established, obviously, Christianity. He is the rock upon which Christianity is built. And now we have the true religion, if that's what you want to call it. I like to call it a relationship. But every other religion is still vying to try to get people to pull in. And by the way, even if you're an atheist, you have a belief system, and that's exactly what religion is, a belief system. Even if you're an atheist, you are religious. You are religious about not being religious, all right? And I'm not talking out of both sides of my mouth. So, Everybody has a belief system. You believe something, and whatever that is, that's your religion. If it's not focused on Jesus, it is a false religion, and God is going to allow it to be destroyed during the Great Tribulation. That's in chapter 17. Next week, we will look at the other side of Babylon. That is the economic side, the commercial side, the business side. This week, we're looking at the religious side. Babylon is a a system that tries to run the whole world. It is the worldly way of life. Not living for God, but the worldly way of life. Paul talked about it in the most theological, all, the, his, all of his letters are theological, but by far the most theological of his letters, the book of Romans. And he opens right out of the gate talking about idolatry or false religion and why it's so bad. Look at me. Whatever you believe is going to determine what you do. So if you believe wrong, guess what? You're going to do wrong. That's why you have to believe in the gospel 
of Jesus. Now look, here's what Paul says in Romans 1, beginning at verse 18. But God shows His anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. How many of you know that some things are true and some things are lies? You don't don't even hear about truth anymore, but God talks about it. They know the truth about God, verse 19, because He has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see His invisible qualities, and then he gives two of them, his eternal power and his divine nature so that they have no excuse for not knowing God. I want to stop here and just say, look at me, everybody deep in their heart, they know there's a God because you can't explain creation apart from a creator. You look around and you see all this stuff and you say, there's no way this was just some big explosion. And by the way, who exploded it? Who timed the detonator on that thing? And what's go- what exploded? Who created something to explode? And it just all happened. I don't have enough faith to believe that gobbledygook. I believe God created the heavens and the earth. I believe God the Creator. So that's what Paul's saying. Verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. Now he's about to talk about idolatry, which is the point I'm making. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols. Ah, there's the false religion. Made to look like mere people or birds, animals, reptiles. How'd you like to worship a reptile? So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. Some of you think that God's wrath is when He gives some cataclysmic bowl of judgment. Well, that's one form, but I want to tell you another form of God's wrath is when He gives you over to your sinful self and you destroy yourself through your own sin. That's what He's talking about there. It says, so God abandoned them to do whatever the shameful things their hearts desire. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Now, what's he talking about specifically? Ah, we're going to get to it. You'll never hear this talked about on television. They traded the truth about God for a lie. They worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex, and instead indulged in sex with each other, lesbianism. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved, homosexuality. So they thought it foolish to acknowledge God Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do the things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand. They break their promises. They are heartless. They have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Does that not sound like American culture today? You know it does. Sure it does. Now for the next two Sundays, we're going to study this sinful, evil world system that will dominate after the church is raptured out. Man is incurably religious. They're going to have to have some kind of religion. And this is what is going to be pushed on the world. This false religion. And the Bible says... 
it's going to be like a harlot. It is going to be so enticing, it's going to be like a harlot pulling people in to commit spiritual adultery, which is idolatry, worshiping an untrue God. We're going to look at that today. We're going to look at the economic side of it next week. Babylon today, the harlot of false religion. Number one, the harlot of false religion, Babylon, is degenerate. Degenerate. It is wicked. Look at verse one. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Once again, in this book, an angel comes to John. Angelos is messenger. An angel is a messenger. He comes with a message from God, an important message, and he beckons John to come and see something, and then he speaks. He shows John the great harlot who sits on the waters. The great harlot is Babylon, the evil world system. Now, I've reminded you of this before, but you know, not everybody shows up in the same service every time. So I want to remind you again today that the word world is used in at least three ways in the Bible. Number one, in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth, the world. So the world is this blue planet upon which we live, okay? If you get on the moon, it looks blue because it, most of it is about 60 or 70 percent of it is water. So it's blue and it's, it's beautiful and all that. That's the world. That's the terra firma. God created the world. So that's one way to use the word world. The second one is in John 3, 16. For God so loved the what? Say it out loud. World. That's people. People. The people on the planet and the planet. Two ways of looking at the world. But there's a third way, and that is this evil alluring, tempting world system that is anti-Jesus, anti-God, anti-Bible. You would think there's so much of it, it's so prevalent in the world, you would think they're having some kind of annual conference to get all their talking points together, but the bottom line is the Bible says that the devil is the ruler of the world in the sense of this evil world system that is going to manifest itself unashamedly and openly during the great tribulation. Right now, it's kind of hiding, but it's always there. It's always there. It's always luring you in. It's like a harlot just luring you in and pulling on your emotions, pulling on your desires, pulling on you. That's what the devil wants. He's constantly trying to suck you in. And the Bible says, don't you love it? Don't love it, Christian. Don't love the world. Don't love that evil world system. Listen to John. He wrote the book of Revelation. He also wrote 1 John, and he wrote chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Don't love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, here's the three categories of sin. There is no sin that doesn't fit in at least one of these categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, boastful pride of life. It's not from the Father. It's from the world. And this world is what? Say it out loud. Passing away. How many of you know that's true? world's passing away. Look, you go buy a new car, set it in your garage, and leave it there for 20 years. It'll be a bucket of bolts in, ten, in two decades. Everything tears up. If you don't believe that, just go look at some of the stuff you bought way back in the day. And why is it wearing out? Your clothes don't last. Your pots and pans don't last. Go look in the mirror. You don't look the same, all right? You just don't. And that's just the way it is. Things wear out. They just wear out. We're about to get all new seats in here. You know why? Because they're wearing out. Everything we look around, everything, where'd that come from? It came from the fall. Look, God originally created it to be 
a paradise forever. There was no death, but now where death comes, there is also this death to the, the permanency that we were supposed to have. And so God says, don't you love this world? It's passing away. James 1, 27 says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans, and visit means to take care of orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world, the evil world system, Babylon. James 4, verse 4, he says, you adulteresses. He's not talking about people that commit, they're unfaithful to their spouse. He's talking about spiritual adultery, which is idolatry. You spiritual adulteresses, you idolaters, do you not know that friendship with this world, this evil world system, is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Look at me. You can't have it both ways. You can't come in here and live for Jesus on Sunday and then live like the devil all week long. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Either serve Jesus or serve the devil because you can't do both. Can't do both. Either serve the world or serve the one who created the heavens and the earth. There's your choice. And then Paul said in Romans 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove or discern what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. If you love Babylon, you're not going to live in New Jerusalem, all right? You're just not. You're either a citizen of Babylon and you love this world and the things of this world or you're a citizen of heaven and you love the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have it both ways. Can't do it. And so he says in verse 1, he said, come here. I'm going to show you this harlot. She's sitting on many waters. That's many people. And she's influencing these people. Now look at verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. That's, again, not sexual immorality, but it's idolatry, which is spiritual uh, immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So you have the kings, the influencers, and then you have the regular folks, those who dwell on the earth, the common people. They're all drunk on the wine, if you will, of this spiritual immorality, this spiritual idolatry, this false religion called Babylon. And then the Bible says that, uh, by the way, you can't serve two masters. I was just talking about that. I got that from Jesus, okay? It's good to get your theology from the Bible, especially Jesus. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve how many masters? Two. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one or love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. It's the Greek word mammonos. Mammonos. And it means wealth. It means money. Literally, it means property. What it means is you can't love the stuff. You've got to love Jesus. You can't love the stuff. You use the stuff but you love Jesus and people. You don't use people and you don't use God. You just use the stuff, the things out there that God gives you to make it through, but you don't seek that. You seek the Lord. You don't seek wealth. You don't get drunk with the wine of Babylon's immorality. Look at verse 3. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, This is this false religion, this harlot sitting on the Antichrist. Antichrist is carrying her along because he's using her. That's what you do with the harlot. You don't love them. You use them. And so he carries them along, and she is being carried by who she thinks is faithful to her, but he's going to dump her down the road, and we're going to see that in a moment. Full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. She's dressed like a harlot, a woman of the street. And she was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead a name was written. She's not ashamed of it. It's right there for you to see. 
Babylon the great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. Again, John sees this vision, and he sees this worldly religion and this worldly economy being carried by the Antichrist. And she was dressed to allure and to bring you in. Isn't that what the world does? You're going along pretty good. You're in your house. Love your house. Grateful for your house. And all of a sudden, you look at your neighbor's house. And they've got this, and you don't have one of those. Maybe it's a pool. Maybe it's a bigger garage. Maybe it's an add-on den in the back. I don't know. Maybe it's a porch. Maybe it's a nice new tree or a garden. Or maybe you didn't look at the house. Maybe you saw the new car that they've got, and they've got a brand new red Camara, and you look at your old beat up piece of junk and you say, Man, I gotta have one of those. I gotta have one of those. Oh, I need one of those. Or you go out and you look at your clothes and you look at somebody wearing nicer clothes. Than you. Oh, I, I can't keep these clothes. They cover me well, they look good, they fit. But oh, you know, I've had them two months, it's time to get some more. And so you go get, and what are you doing? You're falling into Babylon. The things of this world are luring you in like a harlot. And they think, you think, I've got to have more. I've got to have different. You're married. Everything's going great. And then you see some other person. And oh, you see them at work. You see them when they're all dressed up. You don't see them when they have the stomach bug and they're throwing up. You see them when they're all dressed up. Oh, they look so good. And you start having wrong thoughts and you don't take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And all of a sudden now, you're in a compromising situation. What happened? The lure of Babylon is pulling you in at all times. And you have to walk with Jesus. You have to seek first the kingdom of God or you'll give in to it. And I'm telling you, don't give in to Babylon. Don't love the world. Don't. Don't love the world. Where did it start? It actually started all the way back in the Garden of Eden when Eve was having a conversation with the devil. Look at me. Don't converse with the devil. If you tell him anything, quote a scripture at him and move on like Jesus did. But don't parley with him. He's smarter than you and he will trick you whether you believe he can or not. And Eve gets into this discussion. He says, ah, God's holding out on you. You're not going to die if you eat that forbidden fruit. He's holding out on you. He knows that you're going to become like Him if you eat that fruit. Go ahead. Eat it. What is that? Babylon, the world, luring you in. It started with Eve. And the Bible says in Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, what is that? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. The three categories of sin right there, just like we saw in 1 John 2. And here it is, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband, because we like other people to sin with us, and he ate. What is that? Giving in to the world. And the minute they did, they knew that they were unclean. They knew that they were naked and they were ashamed. And they wanted to try to cover themselves. Babylon tainted everything in God's beautiful paradise called Eden. And today it allures us as well. This sinful, wicked, anti-Jesus, anti-Bible, anti-truth, anti-church, anti-God system is prevalent in our day. It is all over our media. It is all over our entertainment. It is all over our schools. It is all over our world. It is everywhere we look. 
And we have got to keep our eyes riveted on Jesus Christ and His Word or we're going to give in to Babylon. Babylon is degenerate. I can't tell you enough. And let me tell you something else. It is also, number two, deadly. It's deadly. It will kill a Christian in a heartbeat. And I mean kill. I'm not just talking about hurt you. I'm talking about take you down. Look at verse 6, and I saw this woman drunk. She's a harlot, and she's drunk. What's she drunk with? With the blood of the saints. And with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. He was saying, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Let me ask you this. Can you believe some of the things you see nowadays in our culture? If you'd have told me 40 years ago some of the things that were going to be on, I got married 40 years ago. If you'd have told me what was going to be going on in our culture, I said, there's no way. In 40 years, in just four decades, there's no way that could happen in America. It's not just happening in America. It's all over the world. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get worse before Jesus comes in chapter 19. The Bible says she was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. I want to say this to you, this harlot of false religion has killed more Christians than any army ever has. False religions all over the world right now are killing Christians in martyrdom left and right. Go to China, they're being killed by the masses. Go to other places, and Christians have been pulled out and pointed out and killed. And look at me, during the Great Tribulation, many Christians are going to get, people are going to become Christians, but many are going to be killed by this harlot of false religion. False religion doesn't want you and me to say the words of Jesus, which he said in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to God through me. False religion doesn't want you saying that. False religion will eventually kill you if you say that. And it'll also kill you if you say what Peter said in Acts 4, 12. Neither is there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven, talking about the name of Jesus, that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And it's sure going to kill you if you say what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Timothy, there's only one God, okay, but let me tell you this. There's only one mediator, only one go-between between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And what that's saying is the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why in the tribulation, The devil's going to take down Christians through this evil world system of false religion. Babylon is going to be drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. It is deadly. Thirdly, Babylon is deceived. It will be deceived. Now, this is very interesting. If I've learned anything in the book of Revelation is God is in ultimate control. God doesn't cause everybody to do what they do, but God can take anything that anybody does and still come out with His will ultimately being done. And He is even going to allow this harlot, this spiritual harlot of false religion to allure people in, and then He's going to put it in the heart of the Antichrist. Once Antichrist has used that harlot all he wants, he's going to throw her down and kill that religion, if you will. And then he's going to have the abomination of desolation. He's going to tell everybody, you don't worship like Babylon told you to. You don't worship the false religion. You worship me, he will say now. And I'm the only one you can worship. And by the way, I'm also in charge of the economy. You have to take my brand. You have to take the mark of the beast. Or you can't buy or sell or trade. He's going to take over the whole thing. 
And the Bible says God is behind all of it. Not that God is causing anybody to sin, but God is maneuvering all of it. He's putting it on, telling this one what to do, that one what to do, so they can get them all to the valley of Armageddon. And guess what? Then Jesus is coming out. He's wiping out the whole bunch. Amen. So just stick with me. I'm going to give you a little bit of this minutiae here and explain some of it. Look at verse 7. The angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. You say, what are the seven heads and the ten horns? I'm going to tell you in a minute. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. What does that mean? I'm going to tell you in a minute. And those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. What does that mean? Here we see the connection of Babylon, the false religion harlot, with the beast. The angel said the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, the woman, is being supported by the Antichrist during the first half of the great tribulation. But then the beast will turn against that religion, that false religion, and make the real religion, the only religion that is is something he allows is worship of him. He's going to be against worship of Jesus Christ, also false religion, only you can worship the beast, the Antichrist. Verse 8, and those who dwell on the earth whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Antichrist is going to pretend to die and pretend to rise from the dead. He's going to pretend to die. He was. He's going to pretend to rise. He was and is not, and he will come means exactly that. He will deceive the world with the trick of death and the trick of resurrection, and then he's going to garner everybody's allegiance. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. Now, if you'll follow me, I'm going to explain every word that is in that very difficult two verses. The angel speaks of seven mountains. They represent seven kingdoms. And he breaks them down in three categories. First category, five have fallen. Five kingdoms have already passed by the time John writes this right at the turn of the first century going into the second century A.D. What are those five kingdoms? The five kingdoms we read about in the Bible were Egypt, back in the Old Testament, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persian, and Greece. Those are the five that he's referring to. And then he says, one is. What was the kingdom that was existing when John was alive on that island? The people who imprisoned him, the kingdom of Rome. And so he says, okay, that's number six. Well, now who is number seven and eight? I'm, I'm not trying to confuse you, but it's actually Antichrist kingdom, okay? Both of them are Antichrist. Seven is the Antichrist before he fakes his death and his alleged resurrection. And then the eighth is when he comes back to life and he lives it out the rest, the short time of the rest of the tribulation. So, what you've got is the first five Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, number six, Rome. Number seven and eight, Antichrist, before his faked resurrection and after his faked resurrection. Now, if you didn't understand all that, call Drew. He knows all about it, all right? Verse 11, the beast which was not and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction. Verse 12, The ten horns, now who are they? I'm going to tell you. Which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. They have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. There are going to be ten rulers of ten kingdoms who are totally subjected and subservient to the Antichrist. And they're going to help him overthrow 
false religion, and they're going to give, they're going to help him reign the earth. They're going to help him spread the mark of the beast along with the false prophet. They're going to help him in all of his doings. They're going to be the underlings, if you will. They're going to be the assistants and the associates to the Antichrist, and they're going to spread the religion of the beast, if you will, all over the world, and they're going to spread the fact that you can't do anything economically. We'll talk about this next week unless you have the mark of the beast. So these ten guys, they have one reason of being on this earth, and they think it's going to be forever, but it's going to be a relatively short time of giving the beast the platform that he desires. The false religion harlot of Babylon is going to be deceived. She thinks that Antichrist loves her. He's just using her for the harlot that she is. And when he gets through with her, he's going to throw her to the curb and he's going to demand everybody worship him. More about that right now. Babylon is degenerate. Babylon, the harlot of false religion, is not only degenerate, but it's deadly. It's going to kill Christians even in the great tribulation. And Babylon, the false harlot religion, is also going to be deceived by the Antichrist. And finally, the harlot of false religion, Babylon, will be doomed. It's going down. Look at verse 14. These will wage war against the Lamb. These is all inclusive. It includes all the people involved in Babylonian religion, false religion. It also includes Antichrist. It also includes all of the ten rulers under Antichrist. These will wage war against the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Say His name. Jesus. Look at me. Don't wage war against Jesus. Bad idea. Because He's already won the victory. Amen? Amen. Don't wage war with Jesus. He's not only a lamb, he's a lion. And the lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are the called and the chosen and the faithful. I want you to say that about yourself right now. Some of you think that God doesn't really like you. Well, I know he forgave my sins, but I I just know he doesn't really like me. I'm the worst of the worst and all that stuff. I hear you out there thinking. I want to say this to you. Here's what God says about you. God says that you are called, that you are chosen, and you are faithful. Amen? So I want you to say it out loud. I want you to say these words. Repeat what I say. I am called by God. I am chosen by God. I will be faithful to God. Let's give God praise. Amen. That's how He sees you. That is how He sees you. And this beast is going to demand that everybody worship Him. So he kicks the false religion of Babylon to the curb. It's the abomination of desolation. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 24, which is eschatological. It talks about the end of time. The whole chapter does. Therefore, he said, when you see the abomination of desolation, this is in verse 15 of Matthew 24, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. What he's saying there is, the people who have been saved during the great tribulation, when they see Midway through the tribulation, when they see the Antichrist shutting down the false religions and setting himself up to be worshipped, it's time to head for the hills. You know what that means? Hide as fast as you can. Get away. And then Jesus said later on in verse 21, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now nor ever will. Verse 15 now in chapter 17 of Revelation, and he said to me, the waters which you saw Where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And at the end of the Great Tribulation, most of the world is going to be worshiping Antichrist. Some Christians who have not been martyred are going to eke out some kind of living. I don't know how, but those ten leaders are going to support Antichrist. They're going to make all of this happen. And they're going to destroy again Babylon, the harlot of false religion. Verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked. That's the false religion. And they will eat her flesh and will burn her up with 
fire. I'm telling you, Babylon is doomed. I've talked a lot, I've talked a lot about the sovereignty of God. This verse, verses 17 and 18, especially verse 17, is one of the most encouraging verses in the book of Revelation. And before I read it, I just want to say this to you. You may think this world is out of control, but look at me, it's not. God is on His throne. God never panics. God doesn't panic over pandemics. God doesn't panic ever. He doesn't panic about the Antichrist. He doesn't panic about the devil. He doesn't panic about these ten kings. He doesn't panic about Babylon, the spiritual, financial harlot of the end of time. He doesn't panic. You know why? He's large and in charge. You can't impeach him. He's not going to resign. Amen? You can't get rid of God. You're not going to vote him out on November the 3rd. He's already on his throne. You didn't put him there. He didn't ask you to put him there. He put himself there. He is there. And you are not going to get him off that throne. He is God. He is God. Listen to verse 17. For God has put it in their hearts. This whole thing, God is using them like pawns to execute His purpose. What is that? Jesus is coming back to take back His rightful reigns by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. Filled full. That's what that means. The woman whom you saw in the great city which is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. God is on His throne. I want you to read four verses with me. I want you to write these verses down. And the next time you think that your life's out of control, if you know Jesus, your life is not out of control. God has you. Look at me. God is holding you in His hand. God has you in His grip, and the devil can't get you out of His grip Nothing can happen in your life. The devil can't even do anything to you unless God allows it. Look at me. You write these references down. The first one's out of Job chapter 42, verse 2. Job has gone through all this stuff, and he was wondering about God and everything. And when God got through communicating to it, he gives this beautiful faith promise. He said, I know. He's talking to God. He's praying. Let's read it with me. Come on. Here we go. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. How many of you know that whatever God wants to happen is going to happen? Amen? How many of you believe that? No purpose of God can be thwarted. Now listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 115, verse 3. Read this with me. Here we go. Psalm 115, verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. Has God ever called you up to ask permission to do something? I don't think so. Please don't raise your hand. He's never called me up and said, hey, Gaines, is it okay if I do this in your life? He does whatever he pleases. You know why? He's a good God and he knows everything from the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows it all. He knows the future better than you know the past. You can't even remember what happened two weeks ago. You sure don't know what's going to happen two weeks from now. You don't know what's going to happen two hours from now. But God knows. God's in charge. Here's another verse. Write it down. Isaiah 14, 24. Read it with me. Here we go. Let's read it. The Lord of hosts has sworn saying. Read it with me. now. I'm not going to read this by myself. Here we go. I'm going to start over. Here we go. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. I'll give you one more. They're all over the Bible. These are called promises. Promises. Isaiah 43, 13. Read it with me now. Even from eternity I am He, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. Here it is now. I act, and who can reverse it? Let's give our glorious God praise. Amen? Amen. Babylon, you're going down. 
It may be through the whipping boy of the Antichrist, but Antichrist, you're going down. Jesus is going to come back, and you're going down. And devil, you're going down. Jesus is going to throw you in the lake of fire forever and ever. Devil, you're going down. You're not in charge. That'd be good for you to say that because some of y'all think you are. I got the checkbook. Big deal. Everybody say, I am not in charge. One, two, three. I am not in charge. Everybody say, God, you are in charge. God, you are in charge. He is in charge. He is in charge. Can you hear the world trying to lure you in? Can you hear this false religion trying to pull you in? Oh, oh, you, 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 you need another house. Oh, you, you need some more clothes. Oh, oh, you need another car. Yours is a year old. You've got 12,000 miles on your car. Oh, you've got, you, you just can't do that. Oh, you need one of those. Oh, you need one of those. Oh, you don't need your spouse. You need that person. I won't tell you. Always luring. Always pulling. And if you're not careful, if you're not listening to the Lord, if you're not reading His Word, I mean, I'm not just talking about, I'm talking about digesting His Word. If you're not in the Word, if you're not praying, if you're not with other Christians, if you're not hearing the Bible taught, if you're not living in the Lord, if you're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you're not confessing your faults to the Lord and confessing your sins to the Lord and getting clean before God, if you're not really, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about just coming to church one hour out of 168. You think this hour is going to do you? You think this is all you need all week long? Look at me. This is just a little appetizer, man. The steak is when you get in the Word by yourself, just you and God. You shut the door and you get with God and you get on your knees and you cry out for your family. Some of you men need to cry out for your family. God has put you there. Some of you women, God has put you there. You need to cry out for your family, cry out for future generations, fight for your family on your knees, fight for this country, fight for this world. Thank God for the kingdom of God. Thank God for prayer warriors. Thank God for people that will win souls and get involved in the kingdom of God and turn your back on the world and say, I will seek first the kingdom of God. And if I need something, all these things he will add to me if I will seek first the kingdom of the living God. Amen.